Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, first Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Live on Facebook. And I am could not be more honored and psyched for the first guest of the new year, Julie Weeb. She's a PT, has over 20 years of experience in both sports medicine and pelvic health. Her passion is to return women to fitness and sport after injury and pregnancy and equip pros to do the same. She advocates for the awareness of pelvic health issues in, uh, in fitness and promotes innovative solutions for women through her blog, videos, and social media. She shares her evidence-based integrative approach internationally with both professionals and women through live and online educational programs. You can find her at julieweedpt.com. If you are a physical therapist and you are in the U.S. and you plan on going to the combined sections meeting in February, Julie is also teaching a two-day pre-con course. This one. One, one day. day. One day pre-con. And it's a panel, so I'm there with a few other uh, smarty things folks. So. Cool, cool. Just, yeah. But cool. it's all on the female athlete, so come join us. Yes, definitely come and join. So welcome, Julie. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for it. having me. This is yeah. exciting. It's a good way to start the year, so... Yeah, I think so. I'm pretty excited, and this is a little new. So as we go through and, and we're talking, if anyone that's listening has any questions or any thoughts, feel free to type them in because we can see them, um, or at least I know I can see them, so feel free. Um, also, if you're on, let us know where are you from, where are you listening from, um, because today we're going to be talking about the, pel the importance of the pelvic floor and how that can affect sports performance. And when we're talking sports performance, we're not just talking about professional athletes. Right. Right? We're right. talking about women on every single level. So whether that's getting back to running after pregnancy or CrossFit or, or maybe you are a professional or semi-pro, a weekend warrior. We're talking across the board, right? Yeah. Everybody, whatever your fitness of choices that's your athletic pursuit to me so whatever that is is recreational to professional right uh, well uh, that's what we're hoping to touch on so yeah perfect. <clears throat> perfect i'm the same way i have like the worst cop i've been coughing <laughs> it's the worst um so before we even get started with that just in case there are people listening who maybe aren't professionals they're not pts um i oh meg swindle oh hi meg she's so cute <laughs> Um, I don't think your comments come across. Just you are seeing good. Plus, yeah, on my cool. screen. Sorry. Cool, cool. So um, let's before we even get into all of the nitty gritty. Can you define what the pelvic floor is? Yeah. So the pelvic floor is a group of muscles, and they live inside the pelvis. So generally speaking, they are um, they are uh, there's four, but that comprise. It's a group of muscles, we'll just simplify it that way. And they work together um, to, and they're most well known for their help with um, pee, poo, and sex functions and keeping your organs inside your body. Um, but uh, we also now understand that it's a component of the core, like the core, which I'll put in parentheses. Um, and it's one of the muscles that works together in a team of muscles to help us with that, creating that sturdy center um, that we all are striving for, but we haven't always included the pelvic floor in our definition or in our programming. Um, we also haven't always included the diaphragm. So that's a, that's a big piece of what I try to teach out there, but the pelvic floor does a lot more than just help you with pee, poo, and sex, although those are its priorities. So, okay. So let's talk about what else do they do? The, well, the big the important? now that we know what it is, why, why do we care? Why do we care? We care because we would like to keep pee and poo um, happening when we would like it to. Okay, that's number one. Um, the other thing is it is a component of happy, pleasurable, pain-free sex. Um, and uh, But then it does have this role that we've really, um, like it's, it's, we've actually understood it for years, but it's only recently that it's starting to come into a little bit more of um, an understanding of how the pelvic floor does have a role in our ability to set up our strength and stability at the center. I know stability is a word that's falling out, but we do understand developmentally that you cannot create, you have to get that central postural control first developmentally before you can build on it with your motor skills. So what we're referring to there is the ability to reconnect with that postural control 
that allows us to have a sturdy center to move off of. And the pelvic floor is a huge part of that. And so when we see pelvic health issues like incontinence and sport, what I'm hoping to do is reframe that conversation to say, if you're seeing that, then we have a problem with that whole system. It's not just your pelvic floor that's weak or strong or long or short. It is that whole system that isn't working well and we need to re help you sort that out because that's a signal to us, or it should be as practitioners, that something's going on with that whole system, not just that the pelvic floor is the problem. Um, so, so that's really where I'm hoping we can turn that conversation. And where where does that come into play? So, you know, you mentioned about uh, athletes and things like that. So, what is the relevance of the pelvic floor when it comes to sports? When it comes to performance? So well, again, and it goes back to why should an athlete care if they can do? So let's put it this way: if I can lift or I can run, and maybe I just leak a little bit, but it's no big deal. Why should I care? Right, and and that's a it's a great question. I think what what I hope people would grow in their understanding is, let's say for example, let's take a CrossFitter who leaks um, while they're trying to lift a weight overhead. We understand that pressure. And, and so a lot of athletes that lift will understand this. Like you have to use a lot of pressure inside your abdomen to help you create that lift. And so when we're talking about something like continence and even when we're talking about how we set up that central stability, pressure is a part of that in our day to day, not when we're talking about overhead. So part of the interaction between the components of that system, the diaphragm, TA, pelvic floor are my favorites to talk about. Um, that they're actually just, they're regulating pressure all the time, okay? So when we set up stability, we're, we're, it's a counterbalance between muscular force and pressure. So if you are lifting a weight overhead and you leak out the bottom, you're essentially leaking pressure. So pressure that you need to help you stay strong and stable underneath that weight and to, and to deliver an efficient and a, and a, and a true rep, you're losing it out your hoo-hoo. And so, so, and so, or what the other type of pressure loss that could be something that would be more, people would maybe be a little more alert to is that same pressure could create a herniated disc. That same pressure could create like a GERD sensation where you like regurgitate stuff. That same, depending on where that pressure goes, we need it to be controlled and maintained and managed well to help you do the lift. But if we see a hernia, if we like, there's all of these things that we know we recognize are pressure related issues that we would take that athlete and say, okay, we need to modify something. If that's what's happening when you lift and you're having hernia symptoms, you're having herniated disc symptoms, you're, you know, and now we need to add leaking to this and you're leaking, that means you're not managing the pressure well and we need to change something to help you manage it and do the lift. Like th that's really what we're talking about. And so, the other thing is, is we haven't, um, because we haven't been integrating the pelvic floor, we're essentially like missing a whole muscle that could help you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm literally offering to give you back muscle, to give you new muscles to help you do these lifts. And so, so the relevance is to actually, we can actually improve your muscular capacity to participate in your activities because we're going to add muscles to your team. And that, and so we're, what I generally get from my athletes is words like, I feel more grounded, I feel more centered, I'm, I'm stronger under the bar, I'm faster, like from the runners out there. Um, because, because what we're doing is we're, we're optimizing the use of your entire system under, underneath the bar, in your athletic activity, whatever it is, in order to optimize those activities. So, so you're losing pressure, you're losing strength, and we can manage it, we can harness it instead. And so as the professional, let's say whether you're uh, a physical therapist or a physio or a coach or a trainer, an athletic trainer, a personal trainer, what, what sort of things do, do we have to look out for or, or things to watch in these athletes uh, to kind of catch this a little bit earlier so that you don't have people completely peeing the ground. Right. When they're there. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, we don't, like, or, or like you said, we don't want someone to have a hernia right. or a herniated discs or, you know, it's not just leaking, right? right. It's, and that pressure system in whatever direction that pressure decides to go. 
Exactly. Yeah. And sorry, I cut out just a little bit there, but I think I got the gist. Yeah. Um, um, I think that there's a couple things, and this is where it gets really cool, because what I'm suggesting and what I'm talking about isn't this like really oogie, awful thing that you're going to have to implement into your physio, your coaching, your training. One of the major things to look for is form. If your, um, his, if your form is poor, we, that is generally, for me, one of the first things I do to help someone's pelvic health. And so if you understand what good form is supposed to look like for a deadlift, if you know a good form is supposed to look like, or optimized form, more efficient form is supposed to look like for running, generally speaking, that's also going to carry over into better um, pelvic health for that athlete. So that's easy. Like we all really understand that. And so, and, and like how that would apply, say for running, um, we know that um, a lot of postpartum runners run really high chested and way up here. And so just altering their form so they're actually, and so then they're behind their heel strike, right? Like, so, and we know that if you land with your heel way ahead of you, it increases your ground reaction forces to like four to six times your body weight. When you are actually over top of your heel strike, so you're in a more athletic position when you go to hit your heel, it's more like two to four times your body weight. So you automatically reduce the demand on that system and on the pelvic floor to manage every heel strike. So something as simple as that could eliminate someone's um, incontinence while they're running. That's not crazy for a coach or a trainer to do. Um, the other thing would be glutes. Like that's another one of my favorites. Like if you have athletes that you are working with that have no bum, they're like, and that's a lot of CrossFitters. Like really, there is a big problem with flat bums in CrossFit. Really? You know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think that would be the case. Yeah, it is. It's remarkable. And you know who they are at the grocery store, right? Like they're in their like shorty booty, short thingies. And you can take a look like they're they have a lot of flat, especially the upper glute is very flat. And um, sorry for the sirens, but go ahead. Oh, that, well, I don't know. I'm in L.A. We might get something here. in a minute too. <laughs> um, But uh, anyway, so when you see a flat bum, then that usually indicates their form is off because if it's a CrossFitter, they do a million squats. They should have amazing glutes. Right. That's why you're like, shouldn't they have great glutes? Yeah, but that means likely their form is off in a way that's not accessing accessing their glutes well. Like that's what form does; it creates availability of the musculature. The glutes aren't ha activated. I, the pelvic floor is not in the mix as well either, because the glutes and the pelvic floor usually are activated by very similar activities. So that's another indication. Like if you have an athlete who has poor form and they have no glutes, you are that's someone that you might have like a little red flag on. And you can have a conversation with your athletes. Like, I know it seems like a crazy leap, but if you can just start asking, like if we could just make it a really normal part of how we interact with clients, especially females, especially females who've had babies, like it will give us a huge understanding of what may or may not be happening with that whole stability system. And, um, and, and we need to just get super comfy doing that. So in my opinion. So even if you have, let's see, one of these athletes coming in and they're complaining of maybe low back pain yes. and you don't ask about, are you leaking? You don't ask about, I mean, you're not going to be like, so how's your pelvic floor feeling? Right. Well, I do. <laughs> I don't know. Do most people kind of know how their pelvic floor is feeling? No. Well, I, you know, it's hard. I have a very, um, I'm, I vet my patients. No, I don't vet them. What's a better word for that? Like I give them tons of front loaded information ahead of time. They know why they're coming to see me. And generally speaking, most people that come to see me have a pelvic health problem and a musculoskeletal problem and a performance problem. And we're treating all three of those at the same time. If you're a, t a practitioner who's like in a general orthopedic clinic, I mean, I remember the first time I first started to try to have these conversations with, with a woman in her 80s who was seeing me for her shoulder. And I said, ma'am, would you mind telling me, did you have vaginal deliveries or cesarean deliveries? And she looked at me and she was like, it's my shoulder. And I was like, I know, I know, but like work with me here. Like I, and so I just didn't have my good, like I hadn't figured out how to broach the subject well yet. But if it's low back pain, we actually have two major studies by, um, oh, Michelle Smith in Australia, where it was like the ends were like 35,000 people. I mean, these were huge. And they found that incontinence and breathing problems were better indicators for low back pain than um, BMI and physical activity level. 
So this is not crazy talk. Like this is a major piece of your patient's physical history that we are literally not asking on our intakes. Like it should be in your intake and you may not get truthful answers because they're going to, they aren't expecting it related to their low back. But if you don't understand how it may be related to their low back, then they will never understand how it's related to their low back. Pelvic floor hooks onto the sacrum. Sacrum is part of the spine. Diaphragm and the pelvic floor work together. Diaphragm hooks onto the lumbar spine. Like it's not bananas that these things might be interacting with why they're experiencing low back pain. And add to it, constipation can cause low back pain. Like constipation's in the pelvic health realm too, but guess what? It's in the low back health world too. It should be. So there's a lot of overlap that we just miss because we're afraid to talk about it with our patients. And, um, and we really need to start getting comfy. Yeah, so we need to start getting a little more comfy because, you know, the thing that I often hear, and I hear this from, from some patients, from friends, from people that I've interviewed, other people I've interviewed on the podcast, it's always this conversation of, can I ask you a question? And yeah. I know something. That's like when, you know, your significant other is like, we need to talk. <laughs> no, it's not like something is going down, you know? Right. Can I well, ask you a question? Sure. Then yeah. starts, is it normal? And usually I'll be like, I'm going to stop you there and say, you know, I'm going to, my answer is probably going to be no, but right. the answer is, is it normal that when I jump on the trampoline with my kids, I leak or that... When I have to lift something, I leak because all of my other friends have it. So isn't it just normal? Right. And and yeah, and that's it's, and common. Common. it's so common. So it must be normal. Exactly. And that's one of the major things that I think we're fighting is I think for a long time there's been silence around it, especially like mom to daughter, grandma to mom to daughter, because it's just so normal. Like it's just what happens that there's no reason to talk about it because there's no solutions. Like there's no understanding of that. But I think that. And because it's so common, it has been normalized, and that's too bad. Um, because we do have solutions, and we have better solutions now for athletes than we've had in the past. Um, I think that's what's really important to share too. But um, but yeah, and, and it's and it's really just about education. We have a ton of education to do from the top down. We need to educate physicians. We need to because they need to be offering people solutions. We we need to let them not say, oh well, you'll just need surgery later. Like. We need to let them know that there's so much we can do to prevent surgery or to put it off or to, or to, you know, prehab people for surgery. Like there's so many things that we can do, but, but doctors don't know. And so nurse practitioners don't know, midwives don't know. Like we have so much educating to do and the public doesn't know to ask for more either. And so that's a big, a big thing. And, and, you know, we're, but it is becoming more common to talk about it. And so that gives us our opportunities to start conversations. And it's funny because what I usually get when I start telling people I'm a PT and then they're like, Oh, well, what, what's, what kind of people do you treat? And then I start telling about it. Like, and I mentioned the pelvic health and incontinence. And if it's a woman, I just watch their eyes. Like you can tell that they're like, wait, wh Oh, wait, what? Somebody treats like them? Like, they, and so I don't always get like, oh, really? Well, and some people go dive right in and they're happy to talk to me about it. But some people, you just know it's there. They're, they get this book where you know you have what they need and, and they just need to like take that leap to start to talk to you more about it. So you've opened the door. That's all you can do. You can open the door. Hey, if you don't want to talk to me about it and you're experiencing any of these issues, because guess what, gang, that are rehab folks out there, people are having leaking problems during their programs at your clinics. Like if you have them jumping around and doing all this work and they already leak with exertion, guess what? They're leaking during your rehab program. They're leaking the pressure that helps them stabilize their low back. They're leaking pressure that helps them regain neuromuscular control of their, of their pelvic hip complex so that they don't get an ACL um, injury again. Like all of this neuromuscular stuff you're doing, if they're leaking through it, or we haven't even talked about diastasis related to core stability. Like, I mean, there's so many pieces of this puzzle that if you're completely ignoring and not being willing to communicate about it, um, yeah, we, there's just a lot that we can do for that. So anyway, sorry, I got off the track there a little bit, but. Um. But I think, I think what's so important and, you know, we kind of were emailing back and forth and it's, it's instead of saying it's common and it's normal and, or you say some, oh, just go see a pelvic health PT. And like I right. said, some people live in rural areas. Maybe they don't have a pelvic health PT. Yeah. Or just stop working out. Or just stop doing this. Just don't do it anymore. Just 
And I don't think that that's the message that uh, as physical therapists or as physios that we want to be giving out. I think the message should be is, okay, well, there's a way we can address this. And then you'll be able to do X, Y, and Z with your kids, with your, a, a, as an athlete. And not only can you do it, but probably do it better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the message. And I think what's really important, and and listen, I have all the respect to the world for the pelvic health pe people that have like, because I'm not a traditionally, um, uh, traditionally trained pelvic health therapist. Like that's the other thing that people really need to understand. I am an orthopedic sports medicine PT. Like that's how I self identify. Um, and I, and I got into pelvic health. I call, I think of it as backwards. Like I learned about it and it started applying sports medicine concepts to the pelvic floor versus the other way around. And, um, and so, and so the reason I say that is for anyone out there that's listening, that's like, I don't want to become a pelvic health PT. Like I, like I'm really happy to refer because I don't want to talk about that stuff. Like, you know what I mean? But if you are the only game in town in your rural community, you got to know this stuff. And I'm not talking about doing internal. That's not what I'm referring to. I am referring to external approaches that use strategies to integrate the pelvic floor and the diaphragm in a balanced way in order to optimize their performance, optimize their health, all that kind of stuff. And I'll be honest, the pelvic health community is small. Like it's one of the smaller parts of our um, profession. There's 3,500 people currently registered. That's a, that's a figure I got over the last year, so it may be better now. Mm -hmm. um, 3,500 PTs registered in the section, and we're getting 4 million new babies this year. Like, there's the, the numbers don't add up. We yeah. absolutely need ortho, sports, neuro, like peds, everybody to have some understanding of how to apply these ideas into their populations and triage it for the 3,500 that need to take it into like beyond what I'm suggesting. Like there are people that this is not, they need a lot more than what I'm suggesting. And, and I think that, that we really need to change that focus in terms of our educating of our own people, of PTs and physios um, and coaches and trainers. Like we need people to keep an eye out for it. We need to triage it and then we can send it on if we need to. But we need to have these skills inside our ortho and sports medicine pop, uh, PT population and neuro and peds. It's, it's all yeah. Yeah. So here's a, a, a nice question from Ahmed. Um, he asks, how can you differentiate between pelvic floor problem and musculoskeletal problem? But I think we covered that because I think it is a musculoskeletal problem because your pelvic floor is a, is a group of muscles. Absolutely. But can you kind of maybe give a quick breakdown of how PTs who are maybe we're not, like you just said, it's a, sort of a good transition, who are not pelvic floor PTs uh, per se, how can we examine this region um, in a way that makes sense? Right, so, and that's a great question and actually maybe that's kind of what Ahmed is getting at. I hope we're, we've sort of hit on this for him is so one of the like i'll use my examination for as an example i do palpate the pelvic floor i just do it externally if you're not comfortable with that and you ask permission and your patient and you're a male pt and your patient is a female and she's like no thank you that's not why i came here it's my shoulder you know what i mean uh -huh. um you can palpate the ta the ta and the pelvic floor are interconnected it is not i'm not saying that that is a quantitative way to do it i'm not saying that's the ideal i'm saying in a triage rural area you're the only game in town that might be the best that we can do and um and there's other clue that it might give you when you say to them can you lift your pelvic floor and you don't feel any reaction in the ta but i am actually i directly palpate i call it east of the anus and so i have my fingers just next to the anus oh no my computer i need my battery ah, i'm gonna have to go in just a second i'm so sorry i didn't do that um but i just palpate just east of the anus and, um, and then I ask them to lift and lower. I also see how it reacts to inhale and exhale, and I get an involuntary response, and then I also get a voluntary um, response. And I think that, um, and what that tells me is how it's doing in relationship to its primary teammates. And then I look at single leg squat. Hang on one second, I'm afraid I'm gonna die. So just yeah, no problem. Problem. I really apologize, everybody. No problem, no problem. It's live, we get it. Hopefully, Ahmed, if you're still listening, I hope that we're kind of hitting on your question because I really do think it's um, a great question. I'm glad you asked it because I think it's um, uh, really great to get this information from, from Julie. Hi, I'm back. 
Sorry. No okay. problem. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I pulled it out without the thing. I can, I can ad lib. Okay, keep going. Um, how can we attract the eyes to take care of the public floor and how can I help? Yeah, so I think Julie will probably cover a lot of that. Um, okay. And then. Uh, otherwise, hi to everyone else, to Shannon and to Alicia and EJ and Erica, Meg, I had you before. Thank you for tuning in. Um, so we had, we left off, you were palpating just east of the anus to ask them to lift their pelvic floor, ask them to breathe, and then we were at one-legged squat. Right. So, and the reason I use single leg squat, it tells me a lot about, well, I look at squats, and if they have a butt wing, if they have a butt wing, that is somewhere like halfway down to two thirds of the way down, somewhere in that department, that is likely a neuromuscular strategy that's not a hip complex arthrokinematic issue. So then that means that their strategy for stability, when they go into a squat, say under a bar or just to pick up a pacifier on the floor, is poor. They're not using their glutes well. And so again, if you don't see glute, you're likely not seeing pelvic floor very well. Can you explain quickly what a butt wink is, just in case oh, they're. Sorry. So when well. you. Go into the squat. Let's see if I can demo one. I'm not actually very good at it. I'm not good at it either. Because because I don't I try not to have one. So can you see me against the blue couch? Yeah. Okay. So when you go down, it looks like instead of your butt staying out the whole way, it's that your butt kind of tucks yeah. in. And so when that butt wink happens, we are seeing um, what we're losing the glutes to support and be a part of the program. And so that means the pelvic floor is also sort of losing its whatever, chutzpah, and its availability to contribute. So single leg squat is my favorite to look at because it tells me so much about their strategy. That's the other thing, guys. I'm talking about strategies. Like how do they use their bodies mm -hmm. to accomplish their athletic activity, whatever it is. So when I have a CrossFitter, they always go into a pistol because that's a CrossFit squat. And that means that they stick their legs straight out in front of them. Mm -hmm. And if they're a runner, but when you do that, there's no way you can do a pistol without totally tucking your butt on the way down. Like it's impossible. Yeah. Which, so we just talk about that in terms of like, we try to train in strategies to help them with the pistol, but I might have to pull them out of the pistol and retrain that for them. Uh, not with the goal of never doing pistols again, but trying to help them connect with their glutes to help them do that. Like people's mm -hmm. pistols look like caca around here. Like it's real, they're real, but they do them all the time horribly. They, and again, it's back to form. And so if you're a runner though, and you show me a single leg squat like this. So if you show me a single leg squat, I really can't see myself. So, but, and you go like this with your leg in front, sorry, mm -hmm. this leg in front. What that tells me is that's how you run. So mm -hmm. if you're running with your leg in front, you're going to be someone that has that heavy heel strike to the front, and you're likely going to drag yourself forward versus, and that means you're not using your glutes well, you're going to use a lot of hand. How many of you have tight, like runners with tight, tight hamstrings that you cannot fix? Well, if they keep running like this, they're, they're going to stay tight because they're overusing them. But if instead they put their foot behind them, then I know that they're in a position to more propel themselves and use their glutes. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I don't say anything. They're like, "What do you? how do you want me to do a single leg squat? And I say, well, just show me what you would do. Mm -hmm. And then it tells me what their brain chooses. So there's no prompting. You're not saying, oh, I want you to keep your leg behind, keep your leg at your side, keep it forward. Yeah, that's smart. I'm just trying to build, I'm trying to figure out what their strategy is. And so single leg squat tells me a ton about running. And so I, I know automatically how, what to kind of, not, it's not a perfect test, but it does give me a lot of information. And I generally see a butt wink. If their foot is in front of them, they're gonna have a tucked bum. And so, because it's hard to control that without like changing up that Jenga of, of body parts and the butt typically tucks under. Guess mm -hmm. what? That means when you're running, you're not using your glutes. And again, pelvic floor and glutes, our simpatico, they work together. So those are some of the ways that I sort of tease out. And then that person might be seeing me for incontinence and hip pain while they're running. I, I just got a ton of information about what is happening for them. And then, you know, you can have them hop. That also then tells you how they handle impact. And if their knee is crashing to the center, and generally speaking, I see that knee dropping in on single leg squats on the side where I, do, I see more pelvic floor, um, qualitatively 
a murkier presentation. Like they aren't as robust on that right side, say. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I link it all back up to what's going on with their pelvic health. So, yeah. So it, to me, it's not like so crazy. Like those are things we should be doing with our runners anyway, right? So, and and that also we have to also to say that when these people come in, like you said, you kind of know why they're seeing you, and you've already done a very good subjective yeah. interview. So at this point you are maybe confirming or maybe not confirming a hypothesis that you have created because of what they've told you in the subjective. And yes. that kind of, so it's it's all of this together. So you have Absolutely. to really listen first and then go in with your evaluation. Absolutely. And so I take a, I, I have, my intakes are on my website. You're welcome to take a look at them. Um, and I get lots of information from that. And then I start already looking for threads like, and that's what I teach. I teach a clinical reasoning class and I teach my, I teach like, what is the thread? So they're constipated. So this is one of my intakes. They're constipated. They have urge incontinence. They, um, and they have hip pain. Like to me, all of those start to speak to an over recruited pelvic floor. Oh, and painful sex. Like if you are, you see that little, little tracing through their, um, through all their information. And then when you're talking to them and, and then you watch them move and you watch how they breathe, because there's a breathing pattern I typically see with tight, I don't like to say tight, over recruited pelvic floors. You know, it starts to all kind of come together. But, and I don't want to look at everybody like they're a nail and I'm a hammer, but it's really like you start to see these patterns. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do is pattern recognition. And there are patterns inside pelvic health as well that can give us some indication of what we might see in their musculoskeletal presentation and in their sports performance presentations. So oh. it's just it's what we've always understood everywhere else. We just gotta start applying those ideas into the pelvic floor and pelvic health. Right. So, that yeah. makes sense. And what about breathing patterns? So you just mentioned you're looking at how people are breathing. Yes. So what are some cues for you that you're thinking, hmm, boy, I think I need to look at this further or perhaps the diaphragm or their breathing pattern is is something that's contributing to their, I don't want to say instability, but lack of... We're not going to say anything soon, Karen. I know. So. Their <laughs> lack, of, lack of that stable base in order right. to help with their performance. Well, just so you know, I pretty much treat breathing with everybody. Um, and, and especially because my, um, my patient population is postpartum women generally. Um, and... Uh, is uh, that a lot of them have diaphragms kind of get wha wacky during pregnancy because the, basically the baby's in the way. Is so it they're way up here? Yeah, so they're up here. That's one of the things that happens, but that generally they have to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And so the diaphragms just can't come down as well. Right. And so that means they can't interact well with the TA and the pelvic floor because that's what happens. Like, the, you know, I call it that pistoning action, the diaphragm comes down, the pelvic floor goes down. When the diaphragm comes down, the tummy comes out. But when you're pregnant, that sort of gets, that balance of interaction kind of gets wonky. And so like, I call it belt, like where, and, and it comes down to rib cage position. Like again, the form that you're using will determine how you're using your muscles. That's availability. Like that we have not yet disproved with evidence, <laughs> with new evidence that's rocking our world. Like right. we know that it, the bicep works best in the mid range. We know muscles work best in mid range. And so that's really all I'm applying alignment to in these circumstances. But so what we didn't get trained to look at rib cages, that's not part of most educational programs. And so when you, when the bell is, I'm sorry, when your rib cage is up, like I this, it, yeah, I call it bell rung up. And then when it's back, it's like bell rung down. And so okay. if everybody just breathes while we're sitting here and you do it with your bell rung up, you're gonna to tend toward upper chest. Mm -hmm. And then, which is a fight or flight breath, which is, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then when your bell runs down, you tend toward. Belly. Yeah, belly. And so what we want is a balance between those two things. And so what I try to encourage is a quiet bell. So we want that bell to live over top of the pelvis again. And when you do that, you end up with more of a 360 degree type breath where you're going to get lateral movement and not just AP. So, and just automatically by putting you in that different position, you give the diaphragm a new opportunity to move in a different way. And it didn't come because I said, stand like this. It came because I said, now let's breathe like this. 
And so my cueing isn't about maintaining this perfect position. It's finding a really good breath. Because when you can do that breath, it takes you out of that fight or flight, which automatically interacts with your pain, mm -hmm. automatically. Um, and then I actually change your relationship of the diaphragm with the pelvic floor. I change the way it's gonna interact with the abdomen. And all of that, those components work together for our stability at the center and they regulate pressure. Like, so diaphragm is actually one of my major places where I start everybody out because um, I can interact with all the systems that they're presenting with, low back, pain, uh, anxiety, anxious, like my pain, anything emotional, I can affect everything by affecting breathing. And it has a huge role to play in pelvic health stuff. So, um, so yeah, so those are like just some clues that I start to weigh in with. But if you, well, anyway, sorry, I could go on and on with details, but, but that's, that's a good start. That's a good start. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I love, breathing is the gateway. Like to me, breathing is your gateway into all of these systems and you can interact with people in that way, in such a positive way. And it hits all of these marks. Like it's, it's so, and it's so accessible to everyone. So again, I, and so I ask people, they're like, how am I going to remember this when I'm not with you? And I say, find that breath again, find where you feel at ease around that breath. That's what we're looking for. And then we get nice carryover because the brain loves to breathe well. Because again, I'm talking about strategies. This is strategies and it's brain strategies and brain work. The brain loves to breathe well. It will do whatever it takes to get you breathing well and that we can use that. So, and I do, that's what I like to do, so. And how do you then incorporate that breath into sports and performance? So, and because that's something that a lot of people are like, when do I breathe? How do I yeah. breathe for this? What do I do? Do I breathe when I lift? Do I breathe when it goes here? Do I, so yes. how do you address that? Well, my, my, um, my favorite line is it depends. And um, because it does, unfortunately. And that's actually the name of my clinical reasoning class. <laughs> so um, yeah, so, and, and, and the idea is, is it, it, and part of what it depends on for me is what's going on with them in terms of pelvic health. So for example, if I'm seeing you for diastasis, um, or, well, let's just stick with incontinence, just, and, and I mean, I can explain diastasis too, but so what we want is for when you're exerting yourself to have some extra control over your pelvic floor in that moment. So what I teach is um, blow before you go. So the idea there, if we understand that on inhale, the pelvic floor goes down, on exhale, when the diaphragm lifts, what's happening is relieving intra-abdominal pressure and the pelvic floor recoils automatically when that pressure is relieved. So we have this pressure and muscular force interchange. So that automatic recoil of the pelvic floor up is supportive to your continence mechanism. And so what I ask people to do is start their exhale before their movements, before, their, before the exertion component, and then that, and in many cases, we have to actually teach people to connect and lift it, have some voluntary control over it at the beginning. Um, and, uh, and so that then when you blow before you go, you're automatically setting yourself up to be under more control of your continence mechanism before you lift the load. So when I'm first starting out with somebody and diastasis is the same way, when you exhale, the di the tummy comes back in. And mm -hmm. so then you're closing the gap and then you're also pre-activating the fascia. And so then when you are pre-activating the fascia, encouraging more proximation of the abs, which gives you more mechanical advantage, then challenge it. And so then you're reinforcing the fascia being tensed and the diastasis being closed. And so you're doing all of that to prepare and challenge um, when things are in their optimum position. But then over time, my job isn't just to prepare you for when life happens on exhale. I have to prepare you for inhalation. And so then we start talking about inhaling on the eccentric part of a load and exhaling on the concentric. And so that's a way to start to develop the ability to basically train the pelvic floor for any position it's in. It has to be prepared for some kind of challenge to come on inhale, because guess what? When you pick up the kid, I would say you blow before you go, get it up. Now you have to walk across the room. So I want you to work on that same breath we've been working on that interacts between these components. And that way I'm actually training the inhalation and exhalation component of that cycle with the weight of your baby. And that, so there's lots of different strategies to apply. And then eventually I'm gonna have to teach you how to hold your breath for a max lift. 
So, so there's lots of different, and it would depend on your needs at the time. It would depend on what works best for you. Like some people, it's too much to think about, and we got to just stick with one or the other. Um, but in most cases, it's a progression of breath strategies for me. So hopefully, that's a lot, but that's hopefully at least gives you an idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was great. Okay. I, so you know, it sounds like everything comes down to having, like you said in the beginning, having all those muscles around the trunk working together in order hi dave <laughs> in order to set you set your body up for the optimal stability in order to lift to run to exert for yes. any kind of exertion right Absolutely. yes and how that's yes because that's how we developed like this is really primal like we start at the center okay all of our movements start at the center we know diaphragm ta pelvic floor actually turn on even though it's a nanosecond they do turn on before the rest of the postural control musculature in order to set an anchor that's like the way that i describe it to myself just to keep it simple but the, what i'm trying to encourage when we talk about that interaction between the muscles it's a dynamic stability it's a responsive stability because the, the deep muscles, they turn on no matter what direction you're moving, but the rest of the postural muscles turn on in a variety of ways depending on what the challenge is. So we have the capacity to have an anchor at the center, but also have responsiveness to whatever the activity is. But if all we do is pull our navel to our spine and stiffen our abdomen, the same way for every activity, that makes no sense functionally. No, no. Like, it, it doesn't make sense, but that's what we've taught for years. Our stability patterns or stability programs have been around stiffening. And what I'm suggesting is let's teach responsiveness of this system, teach it to go through its excursions. So then your pelvic floor is ready for here, 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 here wherever the challenge comes. Mm -hmm. and so so it's, it's really what I'm trying to help us also move away from is that stiffening idea and any single muscle strategy like pelvic floor only, TA only, diaphragm only, like those aren't glutes only. Like I recently talked to somebody about external oblique for this big external oblique strategy. Like it has to be a team, like it's all working together and it needs to move in a responsive way. So, so yes, amen to what you just said. And Great. you actually beat me to the punch because I was just gonna say, so we don't have to go like, huh, okay, yeah. I'm ready to lift and now I can't move. You know, I always <laughs> tell people like, they're like, okay, so do I pull in and then just hold? I'm like, the whole point of your your trunk being able to coordinate everything is so your back and your body can move through various positions with ease Absolutely. and stability. That's the point of this whole sort of trunk musculature from your abdominals, your pelvic floor, your TA, your, your um, diaphragm, so that you can actually move with ease through different positions with weight, without weight, and be able to react appropriately. If all we ever told people was pull in your stomach and go, huh, and get ready for your lift, like, where are you going? Yeah, and, and sadly, that's what we've told people for years. And that is, unfortunately, the strategy that most people are using under the bar. And under, and, and I tend, what I talk about a lot, of course, I don't have one with me. I've been everywhere in my house, but right where I need one, is a balloon. Mm -hmm. Like using a balloon analogy, if, if all you ever do is squeeze your balloon at the middle, like what is that going to do? It's going to change your breath pattern on top and it's going to change what's happening with the pelvic floor on the bottom. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's overwhelmed and it's weak. It can actually fight. Like that's what it's supposed to do. It fights the pressure and the muscular force from above. And that's where we get that over recruitment problem. You're going to leak here too because it, it has nowhere to go when the challenge comes. Like you said, like there's no... It can't respond, and that's what we want. We need responsiveness from this system and all of our systems in order to you know, manage life. <laughs> yeah, and also, like, you want your back to move. Right. You don't want to be so stiff that you can't accept forces and, and those, like, tiny little ones. Like, I always tell people, like, if you were to move your, like, go like this and kind of move your wrist, it's easy and it flows. Make a really, really hard fist and now try and move. And yeah. you it's it. It doesn't make sense. No, and and that's a big piece of what I teach my runners. Like a lot of them come to me and they've been told by lots of people, like you should, or they just assume because all we've ever taught people is kegels. Like that's, you know, there is an appropriateness to that. 
and it's it's really good for one rep max type challenges. But when you're talking about running, if you try to cable while you're running, that's your impossible. It's impossible, one, and then you have people who are like, my back is killing me because it's ripping all the time and my hips hurt when I'm running. I'm stiff when I run. But you can't let your, you cannot extend your leg behind you to propel if you're gripping your pelvic floor. Like it's, the pelvic floor has interconnections out to the hip, hip musculature. Like we have to get that, like this is anatomy 101 and we've missed it in our PT education. And, um, and so, so we need to allow the pelvic floor to go through excursion to, to um, absorb impact. We get that for the knee. We would never land our running with our legs straight. Like we would never do that. Like to run like a toy soldier? Like yeah. that would never happen. It would never happen. We would never do that. But that's what we're telling women. They should hold a cable while they're running. And that's literally a like hard surface hitting a hard surface. You're going to leave. So we need to teach an excursion. So that's why I link. I always start with the diaphragm, that relationship to help link that ability to start to control that excursion and then control impact and forces from above. So, so yeah, agreed. Amen. And so as we start to kind of wrap things up here, what do you, how, how does this conversation need to change? How do we as practitioners, healthcare practitioners, trainers, I don't know, anyone sort of dealing with people with, let's say, pelvic floor dysfunction, low back pain, hip pain, what have you, that are athletes. And when, like we defined in the beginning, everybody can be an athlete. You yeah. know, I don't care how old you are, I don't care what you do, anybody can be an athlete. So as physical therapists, where or, or healthcare, healthcare fitness professionals, what what needs to change in the conversation and what kind of words can we use? Because words are important when it yeah. comes to talking to the general public about this. You know, I, I think that um, there's, there's a lot of, of ways that we can approach this, but I think um, uh, I think some of the most important things is just to is to begin the conversation. So there's a lot of ways that we can do that. And and one of them is to have it in our intake forms. And um, and just start talking about it. Like if you're a coach and you have a group fitness class, you're the boss. Like you get to do whatever you want. Start with a little education. Spend 15 minutes of the first group session. Hey, listen, this is something that's really important to our to us as females. If you're having any problems like this, please let me know. And so just to even open the door is the beginning. But part of what we really need to do as practitioners is get really comfy that this isn't poopy. It's only for the pelvic health, the 3,500 pelvic health practitioners to take care of the 4 million women out there. Like it, that we have to change our own mindsets that this is a part of our population's needs. An orthopedic patient needs you to talk to them about this. A sports medicine patient needs you to be able to talk to them about this. So you need to get educated as a practitioner. Like you need to decide, okay, I'm going to suck it up. I'm going to find out a little bit more about this stupid pelvic floor and how I can apply it into my patient population. Because it really doesn't have to be kind of that one hour lecture that you and I both got at PT, PT school where, you know, it's all about stuff that makes us all go, tee, 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 tee. like that's not what it's about. It's a muscle. It can be trained. And we can apply every sports medicine concept we use in the rest of the body to the pelvic floor. Like, that's it. So we, I think it really starts with practitioners educating themselves, and then they need to get out and start educating in their local communities that this is something that we can actually treat. Because the conversations are coming more easily now than when I started this. Like, I don't mean just with practitioners, but I mean with women. And I think the internet has helped with that. It's because, like... That's part of why we're starting to see, realize how common it is amongst our peers because people are starting to talk about it in their running groups. Um, go to the running groups, talk to the running groups, talk to the CrossFit boxes, like go out and start to try to educate. It's happening. It's start, the tide is starting to turn. Um, yeah, and I think that you do a really good job with that. Just in, in uh, at the end of last year, a recent Twitter conversation with um, – CrossFit headquarters. I mean, you started the conversation. It's open. Yeah. You know? And and I think that probably changed some minds of people thinking, hey, this isn't something we should be clapping for and high-fiving people for when they're incontinent, when they do a personal best lift. Right. Yeah. You know? I, 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 a good way to kind of open the door, like you said, and start that conversation. 
Yeah, and I think that like I just really hope that people can keep it positive. Like we've all evolved in our thinking. You know what I mean? Like, right. and, and we and it's an opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm I'm glad. I hope that people were at least able to go, oh, huh, because I think what the messaging is around that that high fivey kind of stuff um, also is around that. You, oh, well, you you might get better with your incontinence, but you're still going to leak for a PR. Well, I'm telling you, that's not true. Like I, and, and I guess my, my message is, if I could help you PR and stay dry, wouldn't you want that? Like, I, that's where I, you know, like, I, and, and if I could actually help you run faster, because I'm going to make your running form more efficient, and by the way, I can also let you run without leaking, wouldn't you want that? Like, I mean, I think that that's where, because I think the message they've received is it's normal, and so, you know, then there's no solutions. But when we say, wow, we could actually do this and keep you dry, like that's what we're offering. And so so I do hope that it was an opportunity to change. I'm just glad they came to the table and we're, we're willing to talk about it. Like that hopefully it's it's we can start to have more conversations like that. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, and there was something that was on uh, one of your blog posts about this. I don't know if it was the most recent one or the second one. And you know, what you had said, I'm just going to read this from the blog post. If people haven't read it, you can go to Julie's um, website. We'll put the link underneath this. But okay. um, so we're all working in different ways to bring it about a truly global mission. And that is to keep men and women enjoying, participating in and benefiting from fitness over their lifetime without the limitation of injury or pelvic health considerations. And it seems like a goal we can all get behind and all agree on. So it doesn't matter if you're the participant, the coach, the trainer, the PT, the doctor. If we all work together with that common goal or common mission in mind, who's going to say no? I know. Amen. Amen. I agree. I mean, I know I wrote it, but I, I, I wrote it. I didn't write it. I just read it. <laughs> I know, but I think, I mean, it's really like it's doable. Like, I think that's maybe what we need to hear. Like, we could really do this, and but we just need everybody working like around that and, and making it a priority. And and really, that's what we're trying to do, ladies, inside these communities that are you know championing or saying like, oh well, you know, just here's the pad I use or whatever. Like, we need to understand that we're trying to preserve your capacity to be fit over your lifetime. Like, that's what we're trying to do. Like, we're not just talking about this pregnancy time or just when that early postpartum period. Like, we'd like you to stay fit over your lifetime for the ability for you to have great cardiovascular health, great bone health, great emotional health. Like, there's so many benefits to fitness. We don't want to take that out of your life. And that is a message to some of the PTs out there. Like, we need to have solutions for this, not just say stop. Mm -hmm. But we want people to remain fit. Like, that's the thing. Like, we love it. We want that. So let's help people. Make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. We have to come up with like a catchy hashtag or something, you know, help to get there and help me figure that out. Oh, gosh. I'll think about it. Get hashtag it on Facebook. I have like a hash, <laughs> hashtag me too instead of me too. Oh, It'd be P hashtag P, P E E too instead of me too. Uh, like, that's like no P too. Like, how do we say? We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We'll figure we'll, it out. But we'll it. something that, you know, can get people kind of saying, you know, this does happen to me too. Yeah. Yes. It's the new Me Too campaign. But it's the new Me Too. But new, but like how do we like how do we make it like a solution around yeah. that? That's what we have to figure out. Yeah. Me too, no more. I don't know. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll, we'll come up somebody somebody listening will come up with something. Yeah. Too. Help us. Help us people. Exactly. Now, before we end, I'm going to just ask you one final question that I ask everyone, and I probably should have prepped you ahead of time, but um, it's what advice, knowing where you are now in career and life, and what advice would you give to yourself as a new graduate? Fresh-faced, doe-eyed, yes. newly minted PT. Um, I think that the, the, uh, the biggest, and I've said this before, um, in other ways, but I think that um, it is to like stay really uh, strong with your convictions. Like, don't compromise on anything. Like, don't say you know something when you don't. Don't like, 
anyway, but that's a piece of it. But then to know that when we are, in, and we as a profession are in the midst of a lot of change, like we really are, this is a very gray area time for us, is that change is really more of an evolution than it is a revolution. Like it takes time and we all, like you gotta just roll with those punches a little bit. Like you gotta be open to new information. You gotta know that change takes time and you gotta stick to your guns on what you won't compromise. Like those, I don't know, that may not be the best best information or idea, but I just, I just feel like I keep thinking, oh, this is it. Like this is the moment where finally everyone's gonna say, pelvic health's important. You know, because I finally made it on Karen Litzy's podcast. Oh. But, but it's true. But, you know, I know that it's going to take time to turn this Titanic. You know what I mean? But I know that now out of years and years. Of, I mean, I've been at this for a really long time. I've been talking about these concepts for at least 15 years now. I mean, I've been out longer, but it was my own kid coming out of my body that helped me start to think about this stuff. Um, and so anyway, yeah. So I just know that it takes time and that we need to give grace to everyone around us as we do that. So. Um, yeah, I see a friend there too. Hi. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, you know, where can people find more? I know you mentioned your your website, but if you want to kind of mention your website again and anything else you have going on, so if people want to learn more about you and from you, where yeah. can they go? Um, I well, I have a blog, so there's a lot, and I have videos there. Um, I have done a lot of podcasts, so they're all up there as well. Um, so a lot of free content. Um, I do teach live courses. I'll be at CSM, um, and uh, but I am teaching uh, throughout the year. My 2018 calendar is up, um, and uh, and then I also have online courses. So um, and they all have CEUs now, which is a really big deal. Um, and so uh, so if your interest, if this has piqued your interest, there is information available to you to start to put this together. I do have a female athlete course. More is coming. I'm actually hoping to release some new information this year um, in, a, in, in terms of content online and make it accessible and um, and then also get CEUs for that as well. But um, anyway, so there's a lot of information on my website. You can peruse it. You can follow me on, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, always chatting there, dropping some information here and there so um so yeah and send me questions i'm happy to try to help and direct you great and we'll have we'll put everything like once this is over we'll put everything up underneath this um broadcast perfect but, and it's julieweedpt.com that's correct sorry i didn't even say that <laughs> okay that's what i'm here for um everything is there it's it really is a great website great resources so i highly suggest that you all check it out and thank you so much for coming on for Healthy, wealthy and smart live on yes. facebook and thanks for everyone for joining us and for the comments and um this will be up on this page for a little bit we'll put it up on the podcast and um we'll also have it up on youtube so it'll be all over the place Hey. Um, thank you so much and everybody thanks for listening have a great uh week i guess and hopefully we'll see some of you at csm yes that'd be great yeah and uh stay healthy wealthy and smart perfect bye, -bye.